Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Ben Bosky. I'm a player at the PhD now. Uh, <laughs> and uh, this is Between Measure and Meaning, uh, exploring expressions of third table emergence and digital cultural objects. Uh, this is my The point cloud medium and digital survey has been little explored in its overlap with philosophy and theory. Exploring this overlap between the point cloud and philosophy can affect our approach and consideration of such data in unequivocal ways. This research considers the point cloud medium in architectural and archaeological contexts through the lens of object oriented ontology. Particularly, ideas surrounding Graham Harmon's concept of the third table. For Harmon, this is a table beyond its undermined parts and its overmind effects. A table that withholds its being from us but can be accessed indirectly. For me, this third table is beyond its measure and meaning. Point cloud is more than its accuracy and our practical relations to it. Harmon's solution to this inaccessibility of the third table is the theatricality metaphor or vicarious causation. This is the inner space of a new hybrid object where one object can hold elsewhere qualities for another object that would cause some access. I interpret Harmon's approach as expressing something through a non recursive aesthetic medium. The study explores elements from two survey techniques used to create point clouds, photogrammetry and laser. These elements are the everyday throwaway debutage of the digital process, as well as erroneous outputs, misalignments, and noise. Beyond the found object and the undesired misfits of process, we can develop further aesthetic expressions of point clouds that exhibit the actuality of the living digital model. First, we'll look briefly at the article point cloud. So, establishing the point cloud um, as the medium and uh, then exploring the below our object learning methodology and then taking a brief point cloud metaphysics that works these two ideas uh, together. Um, so in short, Saunders and Andrew Saunders and Chapman at all with part of the point cloud, they established an aesthetic basis with the article point cloud and Triple O establishes an ontological basis. We then explore the point cloud aesthetically guided by my interpretation of the third table and further concepts around triple O that I consider third table emergent experiences. Experiences where we do have access to the third table through vicarious causation, beauty experience, semblance, and through the action at a distance. And we'll discuss some of these concepts uh, in the later slides. While we do get at the third table, I contend by triple O's definition, we cannot access the third table, or in other words, we cannot point to the third table. I argue through exploration that we could be so inspired by third table emergence experiences to create expressions that increase the likelihood of further third table emergent experiences for others. We explore this position by exploring the feeling of engaging digital cultural objects, creating expressions inspired by those experiences. These specific objects considered in this dissertation are point clouds, surface meshes, and their surface models. Uh, digital debitage, erroneous outputs, unintended outputs, and artful explorations derived from these prior considerations. So these visuals are my creations, my interpretations of Saunders terminology that he develops as a specific uh, terminology for the point cloud medium. I think this is a, an important contribution by Saunders to um, consider kind of the architectural representation norms in terms of how we look photographically or perspective uh, with elevation and floor plans and then developing a set of terminology that is uh, specific to the point cloud medium's uh, qualities. So these are uh, diatomic bodies that he comes up with, at least this terminology anyway. Uh, the transparent visual character of the point cloud where you can see the outside of the inside and the inside of the inside of the point cloud in the same perspective. 
uh, projected Q. And in rare case of per angelo, this is an angel's view. Uh, so it's a, a view that you can only get for uh, in the 3D environment from a point cloud. You could also see the drone on the interior or uh, or some other sort of uh, prosthesis or scaffolding to get a height position for these uh, respective. In spheroidal cosmology, uh, Saunders presents an orthographically projected copy of an exterior of the textured surface match uh, of the Earth's helix. Uh, so in this case, we've been looking at the sacristy of San Lorenzo in Florence. And here we're looking at a blend of uh, uh, both churches and mausolea, sacristy, and buildings, which we can get all this kind of we will discuss. Uh, number more later on. Um, I return uh, Saunders' term here for while I like spheroidal cosmologies, I like changing it to a textured void. And that these are making, at least thinking around this, maybe this is an exterior shell, but these are all interior space contained to this kind of solid uh, or semi solid uh, object. Ben, are those your images? If you did those, though, Mark, you can do only focus on the globetrip. Right. You can extend it that concept to drones. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, and with fourth one, so these aren't exactly uh, figure boy interpretations, these are more solid boys. Uh, the figure boy that Saunders comes up with is the solid 3D print of the space, semi translucent. And some of the expressions for the end of this presentation uh, kind of move back in that direction. Uh, kind of working with that tension between a semi transparent solid uh, void. So, and I want to focus on so there's many entries in this book. Uh, if you work with point clouds related to scanning, I can't recommend it enough. Uh, got a number of contributors to it, so it's much looser than Saunders collection. It's got numerous authors that are contributing to this, but particularly to uh, Alessio Bortfaz's uh, submission to the book called Me and I. So this is my recreation of, of that expression that Alessio did, where he noticed a, uh, so that's a good day. <laughs> where would people are? Uh, while seemingly novel and trivial, Bortoff might have one of the more profound entries in our point clouds. He and I positioned Bortoff with an outstretched hand at the beginning of the scan rotation, taking hands with Bortoff at the end of the scan. We realized parts of them were showing up in the scan rotation, so we decided to make playful artistic expression in the scan. This is a representative of the play between the human and the the human scanner cyborg. The scanner was designed for some intended purpose. Bortot noticed a peculiarity, a peculiarity of the instrument, and Bortot modified the relation to the tool to amplify that peculiarity. Bortot makes a further observation. The image also highlights the non-instantaneous nature of 3D scanning and the relationship between time and space is susceptible uh, to a point. This was something. It came up in discussions yesterday, something uh, the ontology beyond the particular point to point cloud, beyond its XYZ values, beyond its color values. Uh, what else is there beyond that? And that is the kind of temporal stamp that you might know, use in photographs and film that you see laser scan or temporally bound to the day the conditions of the scan. And also the conditions of the buildings themselves. There was Scan a building at one point, and everything was you know, relatively fine. So we scan it five years later after, say, an earthquake or a flood, we're going to see material differences in that building. So each of these are a unique object in different sense. So with object oriented ecology, this is being applied to the point cloud medium and some of these objects that we're considering, uh, and how we can. Discuss the third table, the essence of the thing or the real object 
that by definition, Triple O is saying that we can't point at, but that we can get at and experience. So we'll do that a little bit further. And then the next few slides will also discuss the most important and particular beauty experience. So these concepts are all alluding to or trying to describe this three factor reality. So Harman sets up this triple or sorry, a triple object, which is two by two matrices crossing objects with qualities in the real and the sensual. So for triple O, they're interested in the tension between object and its qualities. It becomes an ongoing figure that Harman uses to protect um, and explain how uh, metaphor and the cosmos itself, something that he alludes to, uh, increase the likelihood of this experience of the inner reality of the object. And I'm going to go through these fairly quickly. So he sets up these tensions along with the broken link. If we have time, we can do these later on. And then also how the objects, the real object and the central object relate and quality as well. And we can cover that too if we have time. Because the, the main of main interest in this dissertation is the third table. So this is a table between its parts and effects. So Harmon aligns the uh, downward reduction to part with underhand and the upward reduction to effect as a much. And this is from Sir Arthur Eddy, who's terrible that there are three tables of reality. Harmon contends that there is a third table between these, between parts and effects, and argues that the arts or non is the best way to uh, approach this in a non literal setting. So he's aligning literalism with. Uh, with knowledge, uh, which he doesn't argue against, he just argues for the non literal in this case, because there is value in a non literal exploration, uh, and that's how we get at this reality of the, the inner reality of the object. Uh, so, vicarious causation, semblance by Suzanne Langer. Uh, Langer gets quite close to what I mean by kind of free high intensity feeling that is an indication of what's seen that in a reality of, of an object. Uh, and Morton, Timothy Morton's description of the beauty experience also is in that same type of context. Morton also brings in uh, being ecological, which is quite simply uh, caring about things with no utilitarian purpose, but it also brings in the concept as uh, end of the world. So not not uh, apocalyptic nature, but in the end of nature world in a way as a container that is filled with things. There are objects within objects, so there's uh, everything kind of tightly packed into the world in this way. Um, and then Morton gives us descriptions of the inner reality of things, uh, the specific instance of beauty. So beauty gives you a fantastic impossible access to the inaccessible, to the withdrawn open qualities of things. They're mysterious reality. I can't grasp the beauty experience of this point, uh, without ruining it. So I need to leave it alone and it keep ambiguity. Ambiguity I often experience as a floating sadness without anything in particular to be sad about. Sadness here is happiness without a concept. Sad is happy for these people. Uh, and we also have uh, done a lot of work with hyper objects. Uh, funnily enough, it concludes the text by saying that all objects are inherently hyper objects. Uh, it's something that I argue for in this dissertation that actually um, all objects are actually relational objects. There's no object that exists without many, many prior relations happening to it. So, one good example of that would take the archaeology. So here I'm going to read a, a brief point about metaphysics that is uh, simultaneously trying to make an analogy to explain both triple O and the point cloud ontology. So we place a scanner, camera plus operator, a laser scanner plus operator. 
somewhere in physical space. So in this case, we're looking at Castellino uh, Fiorentino in Italy, and we're focusing on that on a scene. Scanner collects information about the scene, objects, and parts and capabilities allow. Maybe 10 meters of high resolution with resolution tapering off of here and 300 degrees and vibrant color and high contrast shadows on a day. In the scene is a building, but we only record its exterior surface. Imagine we can separate the foundational tiles and or the slab from the upper story and then scan it in its entirety, that foundation. We can align that foundation scan to our initial scan. Now we have a part to our initial scan of shell. Next, imagine we can separate the Separate the steel reinforcement in our slab and concrete piles, and then we can scan these in their entirety. We can add now add yet another component to our scan, scan shell. These three shells, exterior scene, foundation, steel reinforcement, are sold just that shells. They hold spatial and color information which can serve visual alibi for actual material properties of concrete, aggregate, steel, and steel. As you can further imagine, we can continue down and down to material components, cement, aggregate, water, molecular components, atomic components, subatomic. As far as we humans are concerned, the subatomic is largely the end of the regress for our scale of understanding. This makes the point cloud analogous to the structure of reality put forward by Graham Well, that is by a kind of infinite regress and power set axis. So we can scan the building, the foundation, the rebar, all the way down to the atomic medical record. And we still only have a series of nests and shells. There is always an access to reality. Next, I'm going to use that the same type of uh, inspiration from both the point cloud and from below to make a, a distinction and also an asymmetry between. The physical and the visual pulse of objects. So, how do we approach an exploration of the feeling of engaging visual cultural objects by exploring expression inspired by third table emergencies in our digital cultural reality? So, there is this inner space where I and the digital cultural object reside. We reside here because the digital cultural object has my sincere attention. This is not a joint inner space that includes me and the physical cultural object. The digital cultural object is not divorced from the physical cultural object as its alibi, nor from its various contexts, geographical, cultural, or otherwise. It is impossible for the digital cultural object to be divorced from its physical source and its context. We cannot say, for example, the point cloud of the Nova Lava Rotunda is the physical Nova Lava Rotunda. Meaning, we also cannot say while looking at the point cloud of the La Rotunda that it is the La Rotunda without this kind of descriptor. We can consider the way Levi Bryant discusses substances and Harmon discusses objects, but we cannot have properties without some substance or qualities, uh, without some object. Qualities must be held by some. Thinking about texture and a modeling or rendering software, even the preview must attach these texture qualities to something. A spherical webcam like think of Rhino 3D or a logo, a key shot, a box, etc. So the digital cultural object in our example, the point cloud of the Lola Rotunda, has digital properties and qualities that the physical rotunda does not. And the physical rotunda has physical properties and qualities that the digital rotunda does not. In this way, the two Villa La Rotundas are discrete or distinct from one another. However, we are still referring to both as different Villa La Rotundas. So despite their medial differences, physical versus digital media, there is still some shared Villa La rotunda -ness in both the physical and digital manifestations, which would imply that neither is the essential Villa La Rotunda. So what is that essential rotunda? Certainly we could infer that some essence is more likely to reside in the physical rotunda, since despite their distinctness, the digital cannot emerge without the physical alibi. But is this actually true? 
Can the digital rotunda be created without some physical alibi? In a sense, yes, reconstruction can be done using drawings, images, videos, etc., but those are of the physical object. So the answer is yes, but there is still some root, some essence in the physical realm here. And to answer the question, what is the essential goal of a rotunda? That pertains to the rotunda so we cannot, that we can get at indirect aesthetic experience, but not point at here in this presentation. No one, including myself, can tell anyone or anything else what the essential goal of it is. You must experience the essential goal of a rotunda, and that has to be a direct aesthetic experience. So surprise. You cannot prescribe this experience by telling someone they need to visit the physical goal of a rotunda to experience its essence. So that might be a good start. So now we'll get into uh, some of the mundane. I'm going to go quickly through the first couple because they are on the preview. Uh, but I'll pause for a second if any of you've got questions just for the last three uh, three weeks. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> so thanks, Ben. I was intrigued by your discussion kind of tracing your work and the um, way in which you kind of saw your work. It's a little bit more in that spectrum of the possible examples of you guys. So congratulations on that. Thank you. Um, Get the object ontology of the essence of Harmon. Is Harmon, or are you thinking that the allegory of the cave and the ancient philosopher of faith that play a role in your dissertation? Um, it's not something I've considered in the context of dissertation so far. Um, Triple O, I think, is combating. That notion of the cave, um, that they would consider also the the shadow path as an object itself, not that it's just this uh, kind of representation of reality, but that both are real in a sense, even if they're using the difference. And that can kind of be analogous too to the physical and digital kind of discussion of the cave. And also a resistance to that. So probably the way to the left path of the cave. Actually, three, they don't want to leave because their reality is a sense of shadow path is rejected on the walls of the cave. So, the philosopher who does want to leave because he wants to get a different level of experience, and that is, is that you know, you, you could explain that in the context of the way that you know, you could talk about it in the building. Or, are you pushing that envelope to say that, that reality is more of a That is more liquid definition. Say is reality. By that in particular, I think there's another philosopher in the 20th century, Zygmunt Bauman, who is known for a concept of liquid modernity. Might look into that. Yeah, that's a while back. Okay. So I was I was thinking of a thought experiment. Um, so imagine that the point cloud that you create in the Rural Rotunda um, is a more complete point cloud than what you had had there. Right? And imagine that um, you have all the tools of an immersive experience in that in that point cloud and we can say it's textured and so uh, almost like being on the star trek holodeck right so is the third table that one comes to in the experience in the holodeck of the Villa rotunda the same as the third table that one would experience in the physical world. Um, no, 
uh, even if even if they were indistinguishable, right? Because of their aggressive nature, their right, right. And it's uh, the same uh, human being, right? Same being. human being, same right. position, same angle, same kind of lighting on a particular day. Um, because they'll, you know, they'll need to leave the holodeck to go to the physical one. So those would be different experiential events. So that third table immersion, that will kind of actually also depend on the person and their experience. If they do have, I would argue that that group is a little different, but if the experience is similar enough to them in their memory, it might be indistinguishable. Yeah, so it suggests that the cognitive foundation, whether it's prior to the experience, right? Or occurs within the experience, that the cognitive foundation of of the experience makes a difference. And that could be that could be context. Knowledge that you're in a different context right. changes the way that you would present yourself to the context itself, um, which would then alter the interpretation. Right. It would be interesting if that was unknown to the person being place in that position at that time and just go back to that <laughs> time. Then if they have the same thing, that makes it harder to say it's the same. So yeah, we're sort of in, in the idea of the matrix, right? Yeah. Um, where that happens in uh, not realizing this is uh Hillary Putnam's idea that if you were a brain in a bat, would you know that you were a brain in a bat? Uh, because they can keep you alive and it would have all these imaginations. And would you know that you were in a jar? Uh, so there's a whole philosophy on that, right? Any uh, any other questions before I go on? Uh, so we're gonna look at a couple of the different previews that are generated that I've argued are these kind of uh, Instant kind of machine eye. Um, and I include them because when I found these, they, they just surprised me that they were that they were there. And that's something that I'm arguing for the kind of the modality of whether it's the experience of digital survey or working with the digital cultural object itself, finding these things um, and having like turning the corner and surprising people with their back, whether that's uh, a pleasant surprise or a horror movie. Uh, usually it's not the latter. Um, while seemingly reduced to representative icons, the panoramic and fisheye images show the scenes and fisheye system now, as just indicated in on the thumbnail for on a depth recap. Um, and that's for each scan position. And then for each scan, we have magnitude for each uh, representative scan location. These, in a sense, even though the, uh, the panoramic is much higher resolution. The fish eye. Uh, in a sense, they amplify the human eye through the machine eye. The machine eye created by humans, yes, but not something we would consider human. They're largely secondary and considered in themselves. And they surprise us when we find them, provoking us to take a moment to consider them, or at least they provoke me to take a moment to consider them. They may appear briefly as signifiers of the scan project, of the scan project at large, or the specific scan position. Which are hardly, if ever, considered the things that the scan project they represent. So, in a way that we can scan and scan location to each other, so that we can hear them, which dwarfs the paradoxical symmetry of both sides. And that same effect we here. And I think those are kind of novel, but they uh, still fall into the same novel. <laughs> Quick comparison of three uh, capture sequence frame animations. So, as the capture sequence frame animation displays immediate raw data of photogrammetry, this mundane object contains maybe the most immediate of the mundane content. However, the images must be stacked and rendered to video in a post production if it's not necessary for any subsequent modeling of the cultural object. 
The idea to create brand animation of the captured sequence began with the ritual of simply skimming through my images after photos have been captured. Captured sequence. To review my images for overlap and coverage. The more I practice this ritual, the more it incentivized the well overlap organized and intuitive capture sequence. Images will come up again uh, when we're comparing these to what I call uh, unintended outputs. Uh, for example, we use the raw data images to generate usable uh, these models. Uh, the texture image has been uh, particularly compelling to me as a found object. Uh, this is a one of three outputs to an exporting the final textured surface model, uh, digital cultural object in this case. Uh, it has a somehow ordered chaos quality of a mosaic, minimally distorted, where in some areas it's fragmented, yet it's consistent. It's not separate from its various context per se, but it's separate from its utility. That's what extracted it slowly in the two miles of map to the geometry through those various files so that we can see at least in the specific case of that it's soft metadata that we'll look at a comparison of these uh, textures with the recap photo as well. Uh, does anyone recognize the building in any case? <laughs> Great, awesome. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, this is the biological site. So this is the decorative element that shows the ball. Uh, and that kind of fragmented painting that I'm talking about is produced in a filter uh, image editing to kind of amplify the character of the, of the texture, not the whole texture. Uh, and this is further how it's trying to organize these pieces of mapping the center and then getting smaller pieces to begin to proliferate. <clears throat> is that a little bit larger? Uh, and that is talking about these different mapping modes. Um, I will be including a comparison of the different models because these are different mapping modes. Does render the texture different on the model, so there are efficient ones and then some efficient in terms of a one to one correspondence and one to one correspondence with the physical cultural object. Uh, in this case, we're looking at a filter from the Polamori Museum in the Netherlands, uh, the Igla Museum. This is the uh, texture image export from that same model of the character development. Goes. So, object recap will keep all of these discrete placing them in rows and separate them out uh, for images. So, less efficient in terms of file structure, but maybe more efficient in terms of the texture resolution. Yeah. yeah. And is that the difference of the algorithm that you sometimes use? Something that came up too with the um, with Agisoc specifically, I was looking back in uh, data from like 2016, 2017. At some point, they changed the generic mapping mode because uh, the older generic mapping mode resembled something more like the adaptive orthophoto here, except you didn't get this orthophoto. It was more like these pieces still, but they were all vertically stacked. So you had something previously that was more like what recap will be added to file today and in some cases. Um, and I was completely unaware of that part of it looking back through the data that they had made that change. I just wonder what that says about the algorithm. Well, we're using an algorithm not a part, but is that you know one of the questions that the, that we've done with the board are we talked to it in the long What's the difference between precision and accuracy? If you're talking about an accurate precision or an efficiency versus an inefficiency, what gets the job done for one purpose better, but it comes to the part, but you seem to be making a map visible and kind of appropriate. Yeah. Yeah. 
There may be a correlation with them. Remember the name change that around that same time. Yeah, there may have been a change in perspective. That's interesting to you that they that they held on to uh well they held on to any of the mapping, but really like I said, they, it does change the layout on the geometry itself. And um, I found that interesting that they have that option there, yeah. but um, I guess it's not just Worthwhile is um, so we can also start to so this is expressing uh to where single texture image uh and we'll look at an example of this later on is expressing really in depth with a lot of relational objects uh putting a series of them together from this point of being interacting with this enemy or of course various towns documenting a number of searches and they're situating together today it starts to become the expression of this relational object between between all these physical cultural objects and blocks of this space and we can get more specific with that and this is almost an expression of archaeological field research this is from a live archaeological excavation where we're documenting each of the uh, excavation lots that we can keep track of artifacts that we put down so we can use layers as we're peeling back, peeling back the archaeological data, documenting that uh, in the model. And then we have here, if we wanted to get into the archival purposes later on, all the texture information uh, from each of those subsequent layers. This is what I was alluding to in terms of a very abstracted. Uh, we can take these boundaries and extrapolate one, particularly if there's someone uh, who's seen this structure and has more any, uh, knowledge of the history and the archaeology and architectural sequence of the site or structure, uh, that we can have much more uh, reclamation and construction and uh, interaction. We don't have to go straight from creation of a cultural object, but this is uh, human interacting with raw material and oversimplified into that case and taking everything else up here. Um, to create something like that shrine, reclaimed by the introduction of the mountains and the forest and the wild Then reintroducing, we have different uh, from point sideboard one, two, and three. These are the human objects relating to these various tools. So in this case, we have uh, non-digital tools uh, relating to the survey site, creating archaeology, classical archaeology, and we don't have digital objects present quite yet. When we have the human relating to now digital tools like our laser scanner here, then we end up with a digital archaeology with all these connected relational objects. Uh, making this um, this non-digital archaeology, and then further, what we've been looking at so far is uh, human computer human uh, software relating objects relating to that digital archaeology survey, digital point clouds, and relational models, and texture. So it takes the kind of three relating one of those steps to make those subsequent um, levels. And we'll look at some comparison and uh, one of them brought up kind of a, an interesting uh, notion with the software. So this is uh, a misalignment from the Adobe uh, Palace. Um, the Senate is the Palatio or the Senate uh, where I was in Henty later, but I was in anyway in Henty and was not now. Something uh, to consider what type of misalignment or what type of error that appears playing for each other. 
Well, it's more interesting to bring the spirit to you from a spark cloud that would be here, dense, and then trying to bring that into subsequent post processing. So, going from Agisoft or photogrammetry information that are seen for image export, uh, the, the software is exciting. We're not going to allow you to do this data like that in here. And it's done that for a number of models. Uh, as well as uh, trying to get it into a lot of the new paths. So somewhere along the way, it's either did there's something in the software that wasn't intended to making this happen, or that was something that was programmed in that is picking up from that input E57 or PTS point cloud file and saying, absolutely not, this is wrong, we're not going to allow you to do this data, at least not in our software. Um, but I, I hope that you can around and try to find one that would allow me to get into this as you know. Um, and this one similarly did not show up. But we can see something more recognizable. So this is from the archaeology museum where we have this twin and we can see that these are the same elements. But not anymore because there's two of them because the size is in the digital space. But still, the post processing software is going to be jumping. Not a lot of you have seen it in that straight line. We also have relational objects in terms of pair within uh, the object or within the instrument itself. So this isn't necessarily an error of laser uh, interacting with material. But something within the instrument itself is going to be shown in the instrument. It's going to come up by a number of objects and hopefully be just really analytical and really not go into the way that I do. But it's quite interesting to see something that was sort of an inner reality to the scanner that we don't understand why it's doing that in this factor. Yeah. Um, we also have plenty of noise with reflection and traction. Uh, the mirror is a particularly interesting one to me where we get the duplicate. Uh, so we get nothing here. We okay? kind of have like an open surface as well as here. This is one of the images that are shadowy out from the ground. But we get a duplicate of this wall through the wall on the other side, and there's nothing really connected here. It's, this can be resolved in the same way that. There's certain films that, that you can apply to these that are removable that you can use this type of air. Um, also, have people suggested you have a building with a lot of glazing and you have dirty windows, don't clean them, and then you can keep the lasers from going through. Uh, and then unintended. So, do we have any history? So, if you remember, and I'll skip to the comparison, the one on the left should be. Considerably more jarring. Given to the my orientation is changing dramatically. That maybe with the models that you saw come out, you don't need to maintain the same orientation. If you proper heat treatment, you can scold me for things like that, or at least get some focal lengths. But it can change the justice where it will allow you to process things. Um, so if you're looking at all three of those undefended. Um, and the, the frame is jumping all over the place. These were done in only like 20 images or so. Uh, there's also been work done with archival images that I would argue are to be our unintended or our archival images of the modeling that will uh, give you a outline of the model. Particularly useful if the structure is no longer in place. So, look at a couple. Uh, more uh, explore, exploration of expression of disease. This is what I was talking about earlier in terms of getting uh, back to that tension between a semi transparent and solid. Uh, and it emerges more at the top view and kind of with this, they downplay a little bit in 3D. So, this is using the X ray filter in uh, Reason Apps Pro. So, this is a surface mesh, not a point cloud. So, this is technically one of Saunders' back on the body instead of the kind of synthetic. And then we can use a normal matte filter to uh, give it a little bit more solid quality. Uh, and then like I said, 
there's a little bit better uh, in terms of that type of options. Uh, and then use that to use Lorenzo and then out of here. We can also go to address <laughs> into different settings. So we're expressing the experience of you know us as surveyors and operators that are working with this data after the fact to try to figure out uh, you know what lighting light size is like in the shade and, and edge highlighting and whether you know we want to use elevation as a potentially more manual scan location filter for the, the color mode. Um, and then we can lay these all out in this expression, and that gives us the sense for you know all the kind of potentiality that we can edit. And this is what we could do for the pulse objects. It's not just the last one that we do in each location, it's the confidence location. There's all these potential things that we can have. Uh, and you can do things like this, you can just layer them all together and it's just a single thing. Uh, you can kind of you know animate and liven. That expression of the experience and feeling um, with these objects. And you know, we're a little over time. Uh, so I'll go ahead and work out these conclusions on the table. And uh, if there's any questions, we can go back to any of the slides that we've gone through so far. Um, but thank you. Like some of the errors, right? So we just go with Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I need to. Uh, I mean, I, I did want to document those, but usually we're just fighting with the stuff to get it beyond not correct so much that yeah, it's something. really great to have a catalog of the like part of the point about it. Practice. You would have like the error of the point cloud <laughs> and then, you know, copy. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about the effort in terms of cleaning the point cloud to get to the condition that we have here. Because um, everybody sees the finished product sort of looking like it, like looking at Ansel Adams. <laughs> okay, he set up there, he took a picture, and put that play there. Oh, right. like, yeah. Um, so you, you can get some of that with the just the collection of the raw data when we're considering frame animations. So there's a lot of rigor that you see just with the mat and how much overlap there is. And then if you can imagine what position you would have to put yourself in, in a place where other people could see it too. Like I don't know, like that's where you go on the whole lot of other times. I like there's other people that are just enjoying themselves and I'm over here panicking and taking these. Uh, so there's a lot of insight into that, but then when you also look at stuff like control and E, um, a lot of that initial capture can help enhance those things, and then also a lot of it is the object itself. So the rotunda ended up being, of course, the periphery having a lot more noise, and it's something that we talked about with like why you know, why did this atlas come out? Um, it had tiny little portions in there, so it's just letting us get too much light compared to that other artificial light. So there's something to be said about the quality of the model now based on these physical qualities of the things you're documenting. Uh, but then you can also go in and though there's still little these physical bits around here that could be trimmed out, but you have to go in and get those things from collection. Could be easier with something like like beyond that dome. That's an easier one to just kind of separate it from what we were looking at there with uh, Buffalo Gap Texas. So you can go in and select that entire top and remove it. So it's less, you know, this is stressful because <laughs> you don't know sometimes. And two, since you're like orbiting around and you can be all the time, you need to be careful you're not selecting points that are behind those because you're actually seeing them. So that's something that helps out most of the time with something like physical laser scanning. Um, there may be a little bit of necessity in this type of 
type of noise if you replace like four of these amp positions actively. Uh, but there's still real there. So when you see some of these things that model, yeah, there's so this one I think the base is X two versus other. And I think there's one without like the balls that got a little bit of a core and kind of got towards the edges, and then there's one that caps uh right at the base of the balls, because that was where the clean model kind of stopped and like dropped it off there. Um, so yeah, there's this you could burn days <laughs> turning all of this stuff up and it's really, really nice. So um when you look at some of those or when you look at uh Saunders or how clean some of those look or other researchers that are doing these scanning. Um it took a lot of tears and hours to get that stuff because it's just come out in the water and it's It's even worse if you do it on the exterior because the lighting is really less cold. Right. Yeah, it almost gives it kind of like a custom camo pattern sometimes when you have shading shading and so much. Uh, yeah. Um, the photo mosaics that you had exported. Were those in their original orientation of how you exported them, or did you go to uh, original orientation? So, follow up question with that Have you noticed any sort of correlation between where you started in regards to your method of, you know, were you shooting up in your first image versus down, or down to the right, down to the left, with the orientation that it picks out the main kind of center of each one? Because there does seem to be you know, some sort of a growth in the scale or a, a shrinking in scale as you're getting towards the exterior. Right? Yeah, I haven't. Um, this was like the first time I put pieces together like that. Um, but I am really interested to see, like, with the location of, like, in regards to the object, where you started, is that where it's highlighted you know, as far as where it's beginning and mapping? Right. It's that I think it might have to do with just like it's whatever the biggest piece is, like, that's probably the area that's got the most overlap from all those positions. Um, but yeah, looking at and trying to like map out where it's standing or whatever yeah. that this is. And then I've not found a correlation between them. I thought maybe that if there were more images in the model, that there would be more pieces. Because um, some of them, like, like the scopes texture, that had some pretty big pieces. And there were fewer images than that. Um, but I think in some of the other ones that I've looked at, I mean, the uh, San Vitale, uh, right in the back, uh, that has about the same amount of pieces as the lower compared to the sacristy. So the sacristy in San Vitale has about the same amount, like 120. And the sacristy, if you look at it back there, uh, those are huge pieces, uh, all the way to the edge. And finally, it gets you to the one. There's almost a inner San Vitale is almost an intermediary between the amount of pieces of that sacristy and the rotunda. Um, the rotunda that that's what's going to find me the thing where it's just like a real quick hundred. Uh, so there were lots of them in the um, yeah, I think like considering the amount of pieces, if there's a pattern there. But also really QR cool. pivots. Building QR pivots. Yeah. Well, I guess I'd follow up on that idea that Andrew made because I admired your mosaics. You had one that was a 30 mosaics. I created different cities that were visible in the middle, right? That's kind of interesting because it reminds me of kind of polychrome marble investments that you might find in a common building or a church basilica or even a building like the Hagia Sophia. In fact, each of those colored stones kind of parts of one another. So there's a deliberate intention to build in those two things. This this is your photo album if you travel to Italy, right? Yeah. <laughs> but Andrew's point about can you can you manipulate those by where you start looking at buildings in the process. And so we think of point clouds and 3D laser scans. We like to think we're letting a machine do this, we're processing the computer to network. It is what it is. The numbers are what are, are the numbers. And that well, what I'm hearing you say is that you can manipulate those depending upon what keep going, right? So again, I'll go back to Andrew Saunders. 
because he very much is creating art out of the laser scan. I, I mean, <coughs> when I read his book, I was always wondering, I can tell you about art. I have to do the same question in a minute. But we're saying, so if, if you went into scan a building and Bob went into scan, and Ann went into scan, you get the same results. It would depend on if you're using the same setting, the same machine, in the same location. So, and particularly the location where you start then is an important aspect. Now you're introducing it's not objective, subjective element that the operator is, in, is introducing into scanning in a, in a more mundane facility. Somebody who really knows what they're doing with laser scanning is going to have really good coverage <laughs> and processing. And somebody like me who's not as experienced as you in laser scanning. I might have that gap, right? Right here, so yeah, I didn't get that data because I didn't think about time. Yeah, so there is this subjective because we're talking about terms of object oriented ontology that it's not necessarily objective, it's the object oriented ontology of the subjective operator, which I kind of like blowing in my mind. <laughs> <laughs> now, let's get back to that question of what does it mean? Because again, I think it's interesting. you can create philosophically and technically all these layers of numbers and even describe the different kinds of toys and techniques and ideologies and everything and build them out of those nuts. But the end result, I think to me, we're talking about the production of artwork that you've done. My question is, if you get into this, the same issue between you go into a building and you scan it for historic preservation documentation is going to be different than scanning it. I just want to reflect the ceiling, but I want the ceiling plan to spread out and make other noises, right? So, what does that do you? I mean, in your sense, you know, in your investigation, what has this revealed to you about the building of everything, about the art of the physical art of the building? <laughs> uh, so I think the, the first part of it with looking at the errors is like the way I think I think pain and I think particularly care, which I think helped me in terms of like my approach later on, and then also with the expression of brain animation, starting to recognize that changed how I was relating to building. By uh, my approach, in terms of making sure that I would get everything, particularly if there are projects that we want the whole building to be the same approach, and it's not just, you know, if you want something just for, uh, for an artistic expression, that you can take three photos of a, like a piece of sidewalk or something, which might be very significant to do, um, if you don't know yet. Um, but I think paying attention to those and then kind of steering the, steering the expressions that we saw at the end back towards the limits of some of the visual tools we were learning um, got me to dig into the software more uh, and fish out those capabilities. And then, yeah, if I want to make kind of a, a Andy Warhol or seriality kind of expression of those or kind of like that. Different sort of thing. Um, I think those express that experience more, and then it starts to maybe point myself and others in the direction of maybe not just sticking around with that software, but other software that would be like express um, both in terms of artistic expression, but also how we might represent building their um, kind of heritage value. Um, What's the best way to do that? And knowing what all the tools you have in your capability to do that, I think is, uh, is important. And I think expression is the way to go with the capability of the tool. It's not just, um, you know, I could have just drawn a matrix of all the terms or whatever, but I think going through a couple cultural objects that uh, actually gives us the tools. Yeah. I don't know if that's fully <laughs> your question. Oh, and, and you know, Ben, I gotta tell you that. Every undergraduate thinks that they're in college because they're going to learn. At the end of your four years, you have a degree, boo boo, I'm done with life. That's just your learner's permit. 
go out there and get the matches to get the THP. And, and I don't have to take a break with you, but I'm sure you know this by now. THP is just an advanced driver. Like, you know how to see it. You know how to see it. You know how to You know how to see it. 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 Or trying to see what kind of journal you place this in, maybe in the future anterior rather than an ABC bulletin, but yeah. you got to appreciate more of the philosophical aspect. A little bit more avant garde. And I would also recommend, and I know that you've got a job lined up again a month or whatever, but if you do a free lead, make an appointment to talk to Professor Alejandro Lee. Hmm. I don't know if you've ever seen Alejandro Lee in his different series, but he uses different perspectives. Perspective view, the camera on the other mixed media to try to create. But if you talk to him about it, he actually has a philosophical background. So what is he trying to show the relationship between human architecture and technology, the relationship of how does that relate? So that it comes down to that you can take the architectural design and by cutting it and showing it and relating it in different ways, you're coming up with new relationships that are that is not creating a little like accident simply because it looks good, but it's actually a philosophical expression. You can easily see you were saying it was take that much, much further and make it later to jump ahead of what what Andrew is doing. What Andrew going to do. So yes, um, taking that with you, what does it mean that philosophical that you're on the verge of that because then you're saying you do it again. Yeah, I think I, I'm aware of his work. I think I've said hello to him maybe once or twice, but uh, yeah, that would be great to talk to him and see, like, even if it's not, I would be interested in the, yeah, the direct relation with the philosophy he was considering, but also just more generally, like, in terms of philosophy, just like what's, what's that kind of like subconscious thread in philosophy that is creating this not. Direct connection, but it is and actually showing some of the stuff that you have in the physical presentation. I want to see that and then see what his reaction is. Yeah, right. Yeah. Because I see that, I see take that that kind of work is kind of terrible on what you're doing. Well, thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you all. Or the people are in the year.